Hello everyone, we're going to get started now uh, and a warm welcome to all of you here. I'm glad to see you all appropriately spaced out uh, as we know that's something very important in today's context. Um, and I'm also happy to see all our students in the audience because we think that's a really kind of important group that we would like to you know, engage in this. Uh, so as you know, there's been a lot of discussion about COVID-19 and all the associated uh, issues around it and we thought it would be an interesting kind of uh, exercise to pull in all our in-house all our in-house expertise uh, and some external expertise to kind of look at this issue from different perspectives uh, so we're going to have um, this uh, kind of looking at it from really a uh, range of views and we hope to have a good amount of time to have a lively discussion also so the format is we have five expert speakers they're going to run through their uh, slides in a pretty brief uh, manner, but then after that, they're going to have an opportunity to sit together and ask each other questions for the audience to participate and ask them questions also. Uh, first off, uh, we're going to have uh, Batman. Oh, oops, Professor Lin Fa Wang. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to give away your secret identity, uh, but I think in nowadays context, it's not that much of a secret anymore anyway. If any of you have been following the news, uh, in Singapore and uh, outside, you know, all the uh, in, uh, information that's going on, you would have certainly heard about uh, Professor Wang's um, uh, the work that he's, he and his team at Duke and US are doing and the really finding kind of work. And he's going to also discuss that a little bit today. Uh, Professor Wang is the um, uh, founding director of the Emerging Infectious Disease Program at Duke and US, as well as a faculty member of the Sync Health Duke and US Global Health Institute. And today he's going to give us a very short history of zoonotic viruses over the last 25 years, and as, as I said, some of the work his team is doing. Following him, we'll have Assistant Professor John Ansar, who's with the Health Services and Systems Research Program at Duke and US, and is also affiliated with the Singh Health Duke and US Global Health Institute. Uh, his work is really looking at developing simulation models of how to map the healthcare system and use the insights generated to inform policies and evaluate programs. In today's context of COVID-19, he's going to kind of break down some of the control and mitigation strategies that have been put in place today and help us understand the impact of these strategies. Um, next up, we'll have Professor Wang Tin Yin, who's going to, um, who's the um, Vice Dean at Duke and US and Deputy Group CEO, Research and Education at Singh Health. Professor Wong will kind of continue that topic of looking at managing and mitigating outbreaks and seeing how digital technologies and AI can help us look at more um, augment traditional strategies and kind of look at new ways of doing things. So let's look at what innovative ideas we can you know, think about. Uh, next up, we'll have Professor John Lim, who's the director of CORE, uh, the Center for Regulatory Excellence and the policy lead for Singh Health Duke and US Global Health Institute. Uh, Professor Lim will take us through uh, looking at the global landscape, who are the play players and maybe some of the roles that these players have in um, managing these outbreaks at the international level. Uh, last and not least, uh, we have Dr. Temur Beg, who is uh, the Managing Director and Chief Economist of DBS Bank. Uh, he has had a range of experiences uh, working in the private sector, working with government and multilateral organizations, and you can kind of look again at the, his handout for the full, uh, his full background. But he's someone very kind of unusual and different from us, the normal kind of person we have in here speaking, and we're very grateful for his presence. Uh, he's going to kind of look at um, COVID-19 in the context of what impact it has on financial markets and economies. And I think that perspective is something that we should really kind of uh, listen to and see how we can think about moving beyond the realm of science and medicine and what are the ways that it is impacting our everyday lives, our, our, our economies, our markets, and maybe he'll give us some insights on how we can gauge the impact of this kind of outbreak, which is really a, at the moment a little bit mind boggling. <laughs> So with that, I'll ask the first speaker, Professor Wang. I don't know why this is going. Maybe I just you know, uh, start by saying that thank uh, Amina to organize this. And I think uh, you know, originally we were going to do a big public uh, sort of forum. And uh, with Doscom, you know, Orange, obviously we can't do that. So what we're going to do now is uh, really going through very quickly, seven or eight slides. What's going on with the okay? It's going so 
you know, she described me as a bad man. So I take this opportunity to say that really what I took for the COVID-19 is really in the context of a emerging zoonotic bat virus. You know, it's been a quarter of century, exactly 25 years. And uh, so this is my outline. You know, COVID-19 is very different from SARS because of the social media. You know, everybody in the audience is so well informed. Sometimes maybe it's overloaded, you know, because of the fake news and everything. Mm. And uh, so what I'm going to do is very, very succinctly to go through some of the points that maybe not in the social media. So the first one is I'm going to make a statement to say it's not the first and it will not be the last. And then really always useful to tell you what I have been involved, five different levels of, uh, of response for COVID-19. Very early on, we're still debating, is it SARS or not SARS? I will touch on that. And then uh, Amina asked me to really highlight two research outcomes from this building or from Singapore. So I addressed two questions about the genetic stability and also, you know, for young scientists nowadays, you think of the next gen sequencing, PCR, the more sexy molecular tools, but in our response, serology actually still play a very important role. And then I end up with the lessons that are uh, from a piece we wrote in Lancet. So personally, I found fortunate. It's kind of interesting for infectious disease scientists. If you're fortunate to deal with outbreaks, although it's a sad event, you know, people dying. So I have been reminded I'm the only person now still in the front line that has been involved in all major outbreaks caused by emerging vaccinated viruses. So I started my career in Australia 25 years ago, 94, we discovered and I named the Hanger virus. And you go 94, 99, 8, 9 is Nipper here in Malaysia, Singapore, SARS, China, MERS, Middle East, Ebola, Africa, and COVID-19. So that was prepared less than months ago. And you look at this COVID-19, I put China plus 24 other countries. Now it's 130 something other countries. So without any doubt, you know, COVID-19 is going to be the most uh, impactful of all of this. But I think it's important to, to really look at that, say, in the last 25 years, we had a six major outbreak caused by emerging bat zoonotic virus, unless we change the practice of wildlife trading, farming, and, uh, you know, dietary, then I think that that's not going to be the last. Okay, so personally, as I say, you know, this is a very different. Seven, uh, uh, 25 years ago, I was in Hanjo as a scientist. I only play a role at the scientific level, but this time, you know, fortunate or the wrong timing, actually I was on ground zero. So I was in Wuhan January 14 to 18, and that retrospectively is the key week. If we did something then, we would not be in today, okay? And then I have served on multiple WHO committees and OIE in the CEPI, and I'm the key member of the Singapore National Response Team to uh, lead the science. And Duke and Yes, of course, you know, I'm leading the science. But there's one role that I never played at that intensity is the interaction with media. You know, this this time, for two reasons, maybe, you know, I'm a bit more senior than when I was at uh, uh, SARS time. And secondly, I was quarantined for two weeks. So I have a home studio set up and did all the interviews. Okay, so that was a, a, a accidental role, but I think it's important for the European Institute for Singapore. So now is this a SARS or not SARS? So there's a kind of a little bit of, in the EID field, unfortunately, there's a lot of discussion, not only science, you have diplomacy, you have economics, everything comes into play. From very beginning, the Chinese government did everything try to say that it's not a SARS, okay? Technically, because SARS is a severe acute respiratory syndrome, and for COVID-19, now we have a better picture, it's 80 to 80% 80 of them are mild, okay? So the cases are mainly mild, but we do have severe deaths. So in that regard, COVID-19 is not SARS because it's not a severe acute respiratory syndrome. But in virus taxonomy, then we have four different levels. We go from the you know, order, family, genus, and the species. So these species, actually now we have a new species called the SARS-related coronavirus or SARS-CoV. And uh, COVID-19 now is called the SARS coronavirus 2. So it belongs to the same species. So just give the layman outside of virology, you know, all human beings sitting in this audience is the same species, right? We have different ethnics of race. And so if you think of that, SARS and COVID-19 is basically, it's the same virus, 
but different strain. Okay, so in that regard, you know, so SARS uh, and COVID-19 is in the same uh, species level. And then in terms of the research we're doing in Singapore, we have made uh, quite a few discoveries. And the latest discovery currently is being reviewed is really our, is SARS coronavirus a genetically stable virus? And then the genetic stable means it's less frequent mutant events and there has pros and cons, right? You know, the pros is that for vaccine the diagnostic, if it's stable, it's good. The con is if you have a bad virus, if they don't change, they keep to be bad. So we're hoping that it changes to be less bad, okay? Means attenuation. So this is a paper in review and uh, it's really hot and there's a lot of media requests already. So we discover a major now genetic change. There has been point mutations reported in the media, but this is a major one. So I think this is a Singapore contribution. The role of serology I was talking about is, you know, so how do you confirm a viral infection? Most of the tests are really focused on the presence of the virus. Okay, so the uh, PCI is the front line. The advantage is more sensitive, precise, but it has a narrow window. Once you miss that, you missed. With the serology can detect virus specific antibody in the host, and that lasts years, okay? We have SARS survivors in current study where compare SARS to COVID-19. 17 years later, they still have antibody and still can neutralize the SARS virus. So what we did is we developed the serology and we were the first to use the tracing contacts. So this got a lot of publicity. So this is a report from science, you know, so it's not just a general media, but scientific, you know, media as well. So really the contribution we made is that these two major cluster in the sort of a church, uh, two different uh, religious gatherings. And uh, there was a lot of suspicion that these were linked, but the, the, the tracing took uh, one month eventually to find out that the missing link was in the middle. There's a couple that actually attended both events, but happened in late January. At that time, they were not very sick. They were mild and they missed the whole tracing process. And the retrospective months later, we used serology to say, that's the link. So this is very important in terms of contact tracing. So I just finished by the lessons we learned. So this is a published uh, sort of a comment in Lancet you can read. And the four different points are there. The major points I want to make is the number one. Basically, the lesson we learned for this is that uh, in infectious disease, you know, there's a corpse postulate that's, you know, uh, established more than 100 years ago. Basically, when you have a uh, infectious disease outbreak of previous unknown etiology, there's a very stringent criteria to prove that before you can claim this is a new disease. So we are still in that mindset, but now we're in the era of next gen sequencing. So the Chinese doctors got sequencing evidence on December 26, but they were either afraid or politically too sensitive to report. And the WHO and the nationally like in Singapore, I was just thinking if we have the same situation, can we do differently? Maybe not much better because the current rule and the engagement uh, policies are not ready to really go for NGS based outbreak response. So these are the things that I put in this commentary. But I think uh, the other lessons we learned from this is the double edged sword of social media. You know, social media is really good to educate everybody and get ready to, to prepare for it. But on the other hand, is the panic and also the misinformation. I also want to say as a Batman, I always finish up to say it's not Bat's fault. Bat has been co-evolved with the virus for millions of years. And actually we in Duke AS, you know, during peacetime when there's no outbreak, we're mainly to study what lessons we can learn from bats because bats can teach us a lot of lessons. And the last is that peacetime versus wartime. The lesson is that for infectious disease, you know, the outbreak preparedness, the work has to be done during peacetime. Thank you. So I'll be talking about uh, the role that models play in trying to understand what is really happening. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically go through these three points and then spend a bit more time on the last point. So why modeling when it comes to uh, COVID-19 or infectious disease? Basically, when you have sex situations, models are becoming much more relevant in helping policymakers to understand the number of cases that we're likely to get and then how the healthcare system can support those individuals who have the cases and will require some care. So models help to bring together all the available information we know 
from FPA studies, from the surveillance studies, from the economic impact, we try to bring all together in one framework and it help us to project or what you call we now casting because we have very short time period to understand how many infections we are going to get, how many of them are going to require care. We have the capacity that we, uh, in the hospitals for us to provide the services that those individuals need. And then through that uh, analysis, we are also able to identify the important areas of uncertainty. There are so many things that we don't know now, and there are a lot of arguments about whether this is really playing a role or not. One example is people who are asymptomatic with, uh, uh, with COVID-19. Are they playing any role in infection? Now, is there really something that is confirmed or we don't know? And there are other issues about mortality rate. What predicts mortality? Is it just age or your, uh, uh, what do you call it, your underlying health conditions? There are some evidence that if you have underlying health conditions, the probability that your severity of the condition is going to increase is there. So all these issues are something that we are still trying to get data on. So when you know all these things, you'll be able to identify how a change in those parameters will change the outcome or basically the, the, the simulation result that you're going to get. And then lastly, models helps us to identify the parameters or the policies that we are putting in place, basically the control or mitigation policies, to see how those policies will impact on our prevalence or the incidence or the conditions that we expect. So I'm going to spend a bit more time on the last point to look at how these things are put together to be able to understand the impact it's going to have on the outcome. So here is a very simple list of control or mitigation uh, strategies that often we hear in the news or is going on in most of the countries, especially in Singapore. The first one is contact tracing and quarantine or isolation. So basically, if somebody is infected and in the case of Singapore, the confirmed case is done, then they go back and trace all the contact that a person has had with individuals that they have contact with, and then they try to trace them and then quarantine those individuals. So this is a very effective policy that most countries Singapore is doing, and in some countries they are doing it, but I think from now in the US and uh, Europe, they've completely lost track of what is going on. Social, social distancing is something that is really going on now in many countries, and in Singapore it's about to also uh, be enforced, which we have now with the, all the splitting of teams at work and other places. And then we have vaccination, we have school closure, risk communication, basically to inform individuals about washing your hands, about wearing masks and other issues. And a travel ban, which is becoming a big deal, and Singapore is uh, ramping up travel bans now. So here, I want to show you a bit more about uh, the model structure. So this is a very simple model structure that I want to take you through quickly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. So basically, we have individuals who are susceptible, and then they get exposed through somebody who is infected. And through that exposure, we have two different uh, uh, pathways. This is people who are exposed but not infected. And these are people who are exposed and infected. But at the point in time of contact tracing, we have no idea who is infected or not infected. So we need to get information about all the contact tracing individuals and then do all the quarantine that we're going to uh, come up with. So here, the uh, ability to contact trace those individuals and the fraction of those we are able to quarantine will go into this quarantine stock because we have service uh, facilities available that requires us to know how many individuals we're going to put in place. So if they don't, we don't have space in the quarantine uh, facilities. We have to give them home quarantine or other, other options. Then these are individuals who are infected in the community. And if our contact tracing is very effective, we're able to move them to quarantine. However, if we are not able to capture every, everybody, which is basically the case, that it's likely that somebody's going to uh, not be, uh, be traced through the contact tracing, what happens is that these are the individuals in the community who create the infection. So the ones who were not able to capture during the contact tracing are the ones who create the infection through the exposure. And then from here, these individuals over time, when they develop severity, because you have my basic you might develop mild and then go to severe. So these individuals over time, when they develop severe situation, uh, severe, uh, symptoms, they might be uh, captured through the healthcare system and they will be confirmed. So the quarantine individuals also go through some waiting time and then some of them are tested and then through that, be able to get those who are confirmed. And then when you're confirmed, at the current situation, they are all in the hospital and they are receiving care. So we're able to get a sense of what is happening to them in terms of how many are recovered and how many of them are going to die. There are certain important parameters that are very, uh, uh, something that I think I, I should try to emphasize. This is the contact tracing time and a fraction of individuals quarantine. This is extremely important because this determines the delay from onset to isolation. Because if somebody 
get in touch with uh, somebody who's infected if there's a contact and that, that individual is infected and is in the community. If the contact tracing is not rapid and fast enough, those individuals get a chance to stay in the community and go through their contact or life normally. And what happens is that they are able to infect as many people as possible, given their uh, their contact, uh, what do you call the contact rate in the community. So the, the speed at which we're able to contact trace and quarantine those individuals will determine how many infections are likely to happen in the community. So here, the next, I'm going back. Yes, so the next here, I'm trying to map all the policies that we are, we are seeing around and then which parameters those policies are trying to, to influence. So here, contact tracing is trying to influence the proportion of individuals that are going to contact trace and quarantine and the time, that, the time it takes for us to be able to do that. Our travel ban affects the imported cases. So how many individuals are coming in into the country with the cases already? So travel ban helps us to, uh, to have some handle over what is really going on here. Vaccination will help to reduce the number of susceptible individuals in the population. So if the vaccination comes up able to vaccinate individuals, then we reduce the, the, the packet of individuals who are likely to get the condition. So that is very important. And then we look at social distancing. What it's trying to do is trying to reduce the number of contact rates in the community. Basically, you cannot run around and do the things that you do. So the number of contacts you create every day is going to reduce. So this is basically, and this is a risk. Uh, communication helps you to wash your hands, do other things, so that it can have an impact on the infectivity. So here, this is basically based on publicly available data set. This is what we have now. This is uh, I sent it to you on Friday, I think. So this is not from from Friday, Saturday to now. The data set that we have in Singapore is not included here. So this is basically what we see from the infection, the number of individuals. This is a cumulative infections that we have in Singapore. And this is a very important graph. This is the number of infected individuals in the hospital. And why is this graph going up and down? This is a very simple stock of how many confirmed cases are coming in and how many individuals are discharged. So this is a stock of the inflow and the outflow. So if the discharge is more than the inflow, the curves start coming down. And if the, discharge, if the inflow is more than the outflow, the curves start going up. So we, are, we just saw that a spike now because we have more people being identified but we don't have the number of people who are discharged is lower than that. That is why we see the graph going up again. And this is the number of people who are recovering from the condition. So here, from here, what we can do is to look at the, to look at possible, uh, to look at possible scenarios because our effort is to try to predict how many individuals are going to, are going to uh, have in terms of the infections in, in Singapore. But as I said, I want to focus mainly on those in the hospitals because this is where the healthcare system is supposed to support those individuals and the capacity available will determine how we're able to do that. So here, this is the blue line is the worst case scenario. Here we see that if things really get out of hand, how many, how many confirmed cases we're going to have in a hospital. And this is the base case if the current situation continues without any policies, which is not the case because we know that things are being done. So the, the base case is not going to be the, the what is that? And this is the best case scenario where we're going to have less than 5,000 individuals over time. So since we are in Singapore and things are being done effectively and rapidly, I'm going to focus mainly on the best case scenario and how policies can, <laughs> can dampen that, uh, that now, uh, what they call the number of infections that we expect. So if you look at this, we assume here that the contact tracing time is about four days. So it takes about four days for individuals who have had exposure to somebody who is infected to be traced and quarantined. Remember, that fraction of quarantine individuals are not going to be perfect. So we assume 90% of those who are uh, who have exposure are contact traced and they are quarantined. So this is the best case scenario. This is what is going to happen. What happens if we are able to increase our number of individuals who are contact traced and quarantined? We see that the, the, uh, the peak of the infect, the number of people in the hospital will go down a bit. And if we are able to get everybody through our contact tracing, still we don't see a significant number of people. Uh, the peak is not going down significantly. Why is that the case? Because the time it takes, that's the onset to isolation delay is still the same. So if you are, if it takes four days for you to run around, the number of people you're going to infect is going to be the same. So even though you are quarantined, you are going to cause the harm before you are captured and sent to the quarantine. And that is very important. So here, this is where if we're able to be rapid and reduce the time it takes to identify those individuals and quarantine them. We see a significant reduction in the number of cases that is going to happen. And if that even becomes much faster, the, 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 number, the, the, the curve completely goes down 
And the last one here is where everybody's talking about is basically close everything down, right? What are we doing? Everybody stays where you are, don't run around, and then we're going to see the demo of contact that we make every day significantly reduce. And here we see a very different uh, outcome. So basically, what we are trying to what we are trying to do is to get a sense of how different policies will impact on the peaks of the infection. And here, as I said, my focus is on individuals who are in the hospital. How many of them are we going to have, and how the healthcare system is going to be able to support those individuals? Remember, in Singapore, we have about 25, 21 percent of the elderly uh, individuals who are 60, 60 years and older are elderly. And then, as I said in the in the beginning, those people tend to have very bad outcomes. So it is important for us to make sure that we reduce our our peaks so that the healthcare system, with the about 387 uh, ICU beds, be able to support those individuals who are going to need uh, care. And what we want to focus more on at the last, my last point here is. What is our policy response on the non-COVID population with, uh, with other conditions? Basically, with our response, we are, quite, we are making certain services available. We are closing certain uh, services in the hospital so that vulnerable patients who are not getting services that they used to get because of our response to the COVID-19. So the question is that what will be the impact of our response to this vulnerable non-COVID population who need care? And we have to be able to address both uh, going forward. So I think this will be my last slide, and then hopefully we can have some questions. Thank you. I'm going to uh, touch briefly on um, really technology and its role in um, this uh, epidemic that we're facing, and how we can embrace more of it as well as one of what are the possibilities essentially because i think usually when we think about sars and some of the uh, previous epidemics i mean i went through sars in 2003 uh, as a young medical officer and there was very little technology right i mean in fact almost no technology involved at that time i mean we were we had mobile phones but it was not uh, uh, smartphones at all right and we had tags and you know, so everything was uh, communicated with very slow, uh, very laborious kind of uh, uh, manner. In fact, information from other regions was almost non-existent. I think Ning Pa probably know that. So you were here, you, you might have to read the Straits Times the next day. In fact, actually, the fear of SARS was high because no one knows what's happening in other parts of the world, right? You're hearing about people maybe dying in uh, uh, in uh, you know Canada and then Taiwan and so forth. So I think fast forward now is 15, 16 years. Much, much more has changed. And I think that you know, the, the ability of us to use technology is quite important. Now, how do I look at technology? I mean, I, I want to give you a sense that I obviously have no experience in infectious disease, so I'm going to really concentrate on the technology part and on models of care of what we are doing essentially from this uh, aspect. You can look at technology in a sense that it could be non-digital, right? And I won't speak very much about it because uh, we won't have enough time for everything. So there has been already some thought about using robots, uh, uh, you know, to take care of patients. You probably can see it in the media and so forth, right? And, and that's non-digital technology, right? Hardware, essentially. Medical drones to deliver medicine. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, the cruise ship, they were thinking that, you know, they're going to drop kids there with drones and so forth, right? So those are the, the other kind of technology. Of course, there's a whole bunch of laboratory techniques, uh, discovering vaccines uh, in the lab and so forth. So those kind of technology, I'm not going to speak about because, you know, it's a, it's a really broad topic. What I'm going to talk about is, I think, focus on digital technology. In, in fact, digital transformation is a very important part of, of healthcare. And right now, we are really going through this thinking about digital transformation. But most of the time, when people talk about digital transformation, they are saying, how do we handle chronic disease, right? Uh, and so we are not used to an acute emergent disease, right? So when we are at, at a sing health level, people talk about digital technology. How do we improve the EMR? How do we make sure that, uh, uh, you know, we can go paper less? Uh, and you know how do we connect the equipment and the test results with our EMR? Those are the peacetime digital technology. Can we use some of those things there? And I think these are some of the platforms that I think we have to embrace to tackle this, uh, particularly since uh, uh, you know uh, 
this might be around for a while essentially. So I've listed the application and this is probably the most uh, useful slide for this uh, talk itself, right? The application of the digital technology, which uh, you can see there, Internet of Things, Big Data, AI, Blockchain, with the standard public health measures that we are going to apply, right? So what are the, the two measures? There are really two ways of tackling COVID-19. One is the way in which we tackle the disease itself, right? So we need to, of course, monitor, survey, detect, treat, and so forth, right? That's that one strategy. The second is that it disrupts the entire chain of healthcare. Our elective surgeries are cancelled. Uh, a lot of uh, appointments uh, are uh, in disarray. Foreign patients can't come in, as you know. I mean, even Malaysians can't come in. It's a complete disarray, right? A lot of patients, they are due for treatment monthly uh, from ASEAN countries now. What, what they're going to do, essentially, right? So there's many things that's happening on the non-direct impact of COVID. And, and this is something that, uh, uh, what we call the indirect mitigation of that impact uh, measures. And how do we deal with these two, the direct impact as well as the indirect impact? Of course, the traditional measures are exactly what we are really doing. So the traditional measures of your um, direct measures would be you have a whole army of people police, calling up people, uh, you know, making sure they're, they're home for quarantine, right? So that's the traditional measures. Are we able to use technology, uh, wearables, uh, uh, ability to use, uh, for example, I mean, what I understand from home quarantine is that you're going to call you and you're going to take a picture of your surrounding and then kind of like send them back the, where you are at, right, essentially, right? So it's a little bit slow and you know, a, a bit of technology involved, but are we able to even do it more? So people that are quarantined are given a wearable and their wearable, like a watch, will exactly tell them 24 hours where they are at. Uh, and as well as, right, monitor signs of possibility of risk of uh, escalation of uh, their symptoms, essentially, right? That would be what I would say would be real good use of digital technology, particularly in countries like UK, where they've given up on uh, these kind of surveillance, essentially. So, so there's no way for them to test everybody. What they could do would be to work with a Fitbit or uh, Apple Watch or something like that to work, uh, to be able to use those kind of technologies. So I've kind of like put it down here, you know, the Internet of Things, I think, has really a lot of possibilities. But I don't think we're using very much of that part there. And then AI uh, would be the other one. And I'll just give you a sense of examples of what this is. What I want to encourage a lot of you here, and I see students and so forth, is to think about not just, you know, the, uh, as I said, the good old public health measures of quarantine, contact tracing, uh, tackling the disease, putting them in ICU beds. You know, every single patient is in an ICU room, uh, even though they have mild symptoms. Could you stratify them? Could they be... Uh, you know, in different settings. So sometimes I think we need to look at that. And I'll just flash through some examples of what I'm talking about. Of course, real-time big data now is available. I think, uh, uh, you know, this is just a odometer, but there are other uh, websites for this. Uh, John talked about modeling. I think modeling is superb. Uh, and how do we get data? At the moment, I think we are still very manual. We're depending on reports and so forth. This is a paper, Lancet Digital Health, using crop source data. In other words, open source data from news media and so forth, and going into individual patient detail. In fact, MOH press release has quite a lot of individual patient details there. You know, it has age, it has where you're living and so forth. So are we able to use that? So that's one thing about this. Of course, in China, they're using big data uh, much better than anyone else, right? And you know, this is a famous thing that you can't buy anything if you are on red or something like that when, when it shows that you are either in Wuhan or something like that. So there come risk stratification from those things here. You will have read that uh, Google is now doing this in California, which is uh, that uh, you answer a question, a few questions where you're staying and, you know, and some kind of symptom, and then they tell you whether or not you need to go and get tested. So we need a little bit of this at the moment. We don't have this even in Singapore, essentially, right? So everybody with any symptoms still goes to the GPs. And what has happened is that the GPs see a few times and then they go to NCID, right? So there's still a lot of cases that's missing. So someone along the lines should design something where they are able to track these kind of thing and predict uh, who needs to go to NCID and so forth. Of course, uh, uh, some things about this is that there's not enough tests, as you know, 
in many countries. So could you use chest X-ray features, uh, CD scan features, use AI to kind of uh, predict the likelihood? Because actually a pneumonia that is uh, from standard community acquired pneumonia and uh, COVID-19 SARS could be quite different uh, uh, from, and the AI might be able to kind of like differentiate that. That's quite useful. And then there's other uh, biotechs involved that are now thinking about using this to uh, monitor and risk stratify. And so a lot of companies in the US are doing that. And of course, uh, uh, communications is a very important part. And I think the Singapore government has done well uh, working with WhatsApp so that you know you get updates that, that are kind of real rather than fake, essentially, right? So those are important. And then the last part, as I said, is how do we go forward from here, right? So there are digital, new digital models of care. So in ophthalmology, you know, this uh, uh, thing used to be quite not much use, but I think uh, a lot of people are now thinking maybe we should use a lot more of this because, you know, you don't have enough ophthalmologists. People can't be seen in their home countries and uh, be seen by, uh, by physical doctors, essentially, right? So GPs are now asked to just call up patients and maybe someone's going to deliver those medicine rather than being seen there. And I think those are important. We are trying to work out various virtual eye clinics. They don't see doctors. They come in, get some tests, and the doc doctors read it separately, essentially. Uh, the last two slides are important. I would say that every crisis provides an opportunity, right? Uh, this is a crisis for our generation. It's very hard to convert people to use digital technology. Because you know they like they always like to come to you know the, the eye center or SGH they like to come right and they like to come once a year and they hate it if you say that you know we are just going to you know why do you go to some shop and we will use telemedicine for this but this prevents presents an opportunity for patient and public acceptance as well as for physicians acceptance I think that's quite important a lot of physicians don't like digital technology a lot of us wouldn't comfortable with Zoom until a few weeks ago, am I correct? And then now everyone's like saying, okay, well, there's no choice. And everybody, including, you know, uh, you can say if your mother or your grandmother needs to start using Zoom, then you are able to convert them. So I think that this is a crisis and it's an opportunity for us to take this crisis because it's going to change the model of care for this. So I think with that, I hope that gives you a bit of sense of uh, why we need more technology in tackling what is a really an old problem, an infectious disease epidemic. Thanks. So I'm going to try and uh, just give a very broad overview of global challenges. It's quite impossible to cover this in a few minutes. So I just picked up some points. Uh, and one of the key things that we're facing now, I mean, as we think of the pandemic epicenter moving from China to now Europe, it's partly because of that first bullet point you see on the screen. There's so many gaps in global coordination and response mobilization. And one of the major things, even picking up what John Anser was saying, was this whole issue of contact tracing, quarantine, and isolation procedures varies from country to country. But of course, you have the other issue that there's so many global and local players, timely disease detection, availability of basic care, which is the major issue now facing countries like Italy, where even in Northern Italy, they said it's a very high quality healthcare system. But because the epidemic curve shot up so quickly, they're simply overwhelmed at this point in time. And you have all these dreadful stories of doctors having to make this kind of decision as to who to ventilate, who not to ventilate, even young patients, a patient dying. So the preparedness outside the health sector is also very critical in the whole global challenge. The second point is also important. It's the resourcing issue that poses a major challenge and why we're facing the kind of state we're in now. Uh, and it's not just a point of develop, developing countries having enough resources. I think part of the concern in the US now is it's a developed country, supposedly, but uh, the resources are insufficient. And so that's very critical when it comes to, again, the epidemic curve shooting up too quickly, and they're being overwhelmed from the initial uh, sort of epicenter in Seattle from the nursing home. The other thing is actually post-crisis. Uh, and this is an issue here because Post SARS in 2003, when you think of therapeutics, they did in fact begin to develop vaccines, but because it sort of petered out very quickly and it didn't promise any money for the, the pharma companies, all the development of vaccines stopped there. So there was very little done there. And now, of course, fortunately, I think the state of technology allows a lot of expedited movement, but that's a major issue that post-crisis, there must be commitment 
to actually shift the attention to look at these things because we never seem to learn and we sort of go through these cycles over and over again. Now, WHO, of course, is the critical player at this point in time, but there are strengths and weaknesses. Interestingly, of course, WHO was set up in 1948 primarily to control outbreak, uh, cross-border infectious diseases, and its constitution gives it that mandate. But of course, you can argue that the constitution of the World Health Organization has no uh, sort of power over national jurisdictional and legal rights. So I think this is part of the problem there. The other thing which Lin Fa mentioned in his slide, and he probably knows more about this than I would, is the whole issue of international health regulations, the 2005 version, which in fact does allow WHO to work with countries to investigate outbreaks, assess risk, facilitate timely declaration of outbreak status. So it's there, but they were heavily criticized in terms of Ebola a few years back, when in fact uh, there was concern that the IHRs were not really used in a timely fashion, and they didn't have that mandate to facilitate it. And even for this uh, COVID-19 outbreak, uh, when it was quite clear it was by definition a pandemic, WHO actually took some time to make the official declaration that it is so. Uh, and of course, that links to the last bullet point, that there's concern on the political influence on what really should be scientific and technical decisions. And again, you could argue uh, in the US, what is it that is driving it at the moment in terms of the approaches? The science and the, the technical issues are very clear, but it's confronted by a whole lot of polarization in terms of politics. And this is where they're facing a lot of issues now. So the public doesn't know who to trust, the messages are all different, and the healthcare institutions cannot respond. The scientists also were complaining, of course, that funding was withdrawn, and now that contributed, in fact, to that slowness. So if you come back to WHO, in fact, smallpox eradication from a program that started in 1966 is its greatest success. But since then, especially in this century with H1N1, Ebola, it's been highly criticized. What about the current response for COVID-19? I would say it's actually quite good. The current DG has been fairly forthright, and he's been fairly proactive in terms of his uh, press conferences and keeping people informed. But of the situation in the last two weeks, it seems WHO can't say very much. Once the thing began to peak in Italy and now it's spread across Europe and the situation in the US, um, I haven't heard very much really in terms of new things. WHO is restating what it stated in uh, late January and throughout February. And a part of this is um, linked to the fact that uh, the, the second last bullet point, it's a very extensive organization across many countries, but it's often been criticized that the bureaucracy and the organization hamper its efficiency. And so the current DG, when he came in, has been doing a lot of reorganization. And so I think he's benefiting partly from that uh, in installing several assistant DGs who then have better control, but uh, it still remains to be seen how this will play out. Now, in terms of what happens in an outbreak situation when you're trying to approve new therapeutics and vaccines, there is an emergency use assessment listing mechanism that was developed just a few years ago as a result of the Ebola outbreak. And this is a risk-based procedure that if you have therapeutics that are coming through, you may not necessarily have to take them through the whole regulatory approval cycle to determine safety, efficacy, and quality. And so there is a series of procedures that you go into the document, but of course, it's just a set of procedures. It doesn't actually tell you what to do with the product in terms of assessing it. So again, it's helpful, but actually not that helpful. But the good thing was the latest version was just updated in January 2020, just in time. But of course, it hasn't really been mobilized or used yet for the current outbreak. The other thing, of course, is the proliferation of innovative platform technologies that Tianyin referred to is very true. It's accelerated the whole area of therapeutics development, including the antivirals and vaccines. But also remember that the in vitro diagnostic is critical. How do you actually diagnose whether, in fact, the patient has COVID-19? And the issue in the US a few weeks back was that the FDA was extremely strict in terms of requiring approvals of the diagnostic kits. As a result of which there was a whole lot of bureaucracy, they only approved the CDC kit, and that was defective when it went out. And only in the last 24 hours, we see that they've said, now every state can make its own decision, doesn't need FDA approval, which actually should have been the kind of situation at that point, because whether it's exactly 100% correct that this kit determines diagnosis to another 
you really want to, picking up what John Axel was saying, diagnose quickly and treat so that the healthcare professionals can make a clear decision. The final slide I'd really like to touch on is this. Um, in fact, we're making up for a lot of lost time since SARS because, as I was saying, there was an initial coronavirus vaccine development. It was not pursued in 2003 once SARS beat it out. But incredibly, over the last few months, we now have, uh, if we just look at vaccines, there are 10 to 15 serious vaccine developments for the virus, for the coronavirus. And the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CEPI, which was just set up three years ago at the World Economic Forum with a lot of backing from the Gates Foundation, is really leading the charge in this. They've already signed contracts with six companies for vaccine candidates. And in fact, the one from Moderna is already going into clinical trials already in Seattle. They have scope to take on another two. And CEPI says they will need $2 billion just to uh, determine potentially to prove three vaccines are uh, useful and effective. But the problem now is that there's a lot of parallel research going on, very innovative vaccines, not the traditional type of vaccines anymore, and they're not building on previous findings. And one critical concern was the issue of antibody-dependent enhancement, because uh, in animal models they found for, as they were developing vaccines for SARS and MERS, there was this concern, a bit like in the dengue situation, if uh, a patient has already been exposed, there's a certain antibody titer there, in fact, if it's at that kind of range, it may cause a very severe reaction and cause even more uh, damage and adverse impact on the patient. So it's hopeful, but of course, everyone says, don't be too hopeful. It will take 12 to 18 months for full regulatory approval. So phase one trial is just beginning. We're hopeful that some of them actually will be carried out here in a conjunction with DINFAS EID program. Uh, so some may in fact be uh, tested in Singapore, but you have a lot of coordination, cooperation going on. And when it comes to regulatory approval, uh, going back to what I was saying earlier for the WHO emergency use and listing mechanism, really you cannot follow the traditional uh, referencing and reliance approaches, and yet safety is still critical and paramount. Nothing worse than saying you can use this vaccine and then patients uh, suffer or die as a result of it. So I will just leave these points with you for your consideration. The last slide is basically a uh, kind of wish list. It should be like this uh, for future enhanced coordination. And you can read these points yourself. So thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, change of track, right? You've heard the specialist. Now you're going to hear from a generalist who is going to look at this thing from a very different perspective. Uh, many of you don't know this, but my dissertation was about financial market contagion in emerging markets. So in our world of economics and finance, when one country catches a flu, it spreads elsewhere, and that's what's happening in the world right now. That cross-border transmission of financial market stress is paramount. And the sort of coordination that the professors talked about and the public health and epidemiology side, we need that also on economics and finance. And we have a bunch of bodies for that. And like SARS, we learn from the GFC in 2008, 2009, and we have G7 and G20 trying to coordinate not working very well so far, um, otherwise the markets would have reacted better. Now, what we do is we also are now armchair epidemiologists, and we heard John Anser's intricate model of uh, contagion. Um, we try to summarize it in a two-dimensional space, where R0 is the horizontal axis and fatality rate is in the vertical axis. Um, this sort of chart started making rounds in the analyst community about a month and a half ago. And everybody would say, it's not a big deal. It's not particularly contagious. It's not particularly fatal. Um, wouldn't you rather not be there or not be there and be somewhere here? It's all going to work out. When China was struggling through COVID-19 all the way through January and February, that was the global market's conclusion. Not a big deal. A China problem. Once it spreads, we know what to do. Um, and if you get it, you're going to survive, no big deal. Um, you know, and I think a lot of you guys probably know this already, it was a revelation for the financial markets that in the Spanish influence in 1918 was not there or there. It was also kind of around here, except that millions and millions of people got it, and therefore hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people died. Uh, and I think that's the sort of realization that's setting into the markets now, and people are beginning to panic. Um, so, again, with apologies to John Anza's intricate model. This is the way we're thinking about it, right? That the R naught is a function of three things. Um, 
B is the infection rate. If you go in contact with somebody who has COVID-19, uh, what's the probability of you getting it? K is the um, contact rate. Uh, and that, of course, is you know how many times that person has come into contact with people. And D is the so the probability of infection uh, lasting. Uh, and again, the market's view was, well, no big deal. Uh, we can do deal with B with behavior. Wash your hands. Don't shake hands. Uh, we can deal with K with policy, lockdown places if need be. Uh, and we can deal with D with treatment or quarantine. Uh, it's turning out that um, it looks pretty elegant and nice in paper. The problem is that there's huge heterogeneity in global responses. And even today as we speak, the way the Brits and the Swiss are dealing with this, the Scandinavians are dealing with it, very different from the way the Americans and the Italians are dealing with it, and very different from the way we have been dealing with it. Um, and I think that's what's causing a lot of concern in the market, that there isn't a globally coordinated, uniform response, and there is a lot of crosstalk between policymakers and responders. And, and that's creating uncertainty, and the markets hate uncertainty. So. Now we have all these questions, you know, when will this end and how will it end and what will be the damage? And even like, you know, technical questions like, you know, do disease infection models are, should be three dimensional, not two. So beyond, beyond R naught and beyond uh, the uh, fatality rate should be considered this thing. The asymptomatic carriers can be infectious. And if that is the case, the game is up. All these people, all this, you know, temperature uh, tracking, all that stuff is not gonna work because uh, um, people who are not uh, symptomatic are spreading the germ. That's the sort of panic that we're seeing. In fact, I'm sort of waiting for the world of WHO and so on to come up with decent estimates for that last question, because I don't think the markets feel that the public health officials themselves have a very good handle on that last question. So what's happening globally as a result? Well, began with China, factory shutdowns all over, and China is a factory of the world, so we had a huge supply shock. And that supply shock has not materialized yet. You will see that happening in the shelves of finished goods in the coming months and quarters when things don't show up because we did not get made in China in the months of February and March. Uh, I was in Dhaka, Bangladesh recently, um, more than 14 days ago, uh, and uh, a friend of mine who runs a garments company, I believe he supplies for Mark and Spencer, and he said that if the raw materials from China don't come in the next few weeks, the shirts that he makes for the fall season will not show up in Mark and Spencer shelves from August, September onward. So that's a sort of rippling effect that we will see because of the supply crunch. Um, and, and mind you, even if China goes back to work, and I'll share some data on how China is going back to work, it does not necessarily mean that things can get resolved very, very quickly. Uh, people may not be confident about coming back to work. And even if they come back to work, the supply side issue would also have to deal with the demand side issue, that the damage is now so widespread and people's expectations are now deteriorating so fast, they wouldn't want to buy stuff. And as a result, just as supply comes back onto stream, the demand starts to convulse. And that's where we need to consider two issues. Number one, the world is not about just goods consumption. Yes, at this moment, um, we are holding laptops and looking at screens and uh, um, using our smartphones. I mean, these are things that are made in China. And if the Chinese work double, triple shift through the months of March, April, May, June, we may get a lot of the stuff back. But the world is largely a service sector. We consume travel, and tourism, and movies, and restaurant meals. And all of that is coming to a standstill as we speak. Now, that's the sort of challenge we're dealing with right now, that the service sector distress, you can make up for it by going to movies three times in a day, or eating 10 different restaurants. It just doesn't happen. So the loss from service sector um, cessation of activity is more like a deadlift loss. Um, then we have a lot of issues on credit risk. Can companies pay back their loans? If they can, what happens to banks, which is why bank shares are all, prices are down 20, 30, 40% in the past week or so. And then this issue that G7, G20, and so on are meeting and announcing measures. The Federal Reserve of the US cut interest rates down to zero yesterday. Are these sufficient? The markets are saying no. They, they feel that you know, cutting interest rates is not going to kill the virus. They don't believe that you know, giving people tax cuts is going to reduce the rate of infection, and they're correct, of course. Um, can't go away with all bad news. So let me show you some interesting data. 
Um, this is a chart where 100 would be the trend. And this is latest information. So as of Sunday, which is when I sent many of these slides, um, road congestion in China is about 60% of trend. If I had been with you a month ago, that number would have been like 20. So it's picking up. Subway use hasn't picked up quite yet. It's about 30% from trend. Migrants entering large cities. Again, this would have been like 10, 20 a few weeks ago, but people are going back to work. People are not going to the movies. Actually, the movie theaters are closed. Hence, that's a zero relative to trend. Uh, property sales have picked up. In fact, property prices went up in China in January, February. So speculation hasn't gone away. And this is interesting. And I think this goes back to the going back to work issue, which is coal use at power plants is already close to 80% as of this weekend. So while the rest of the world convulses and is in total panic mode as we speak, China, where it all began, is going back to work. So that's the silver lining. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Please, we're going to come up here and uh, have an opportunity to ask some questions. But um, I'll start with, actually, we have uh, Mike Masson, the director of the Singh Health Duke Global Health <coughs> Institute on uh, Zoom, as, as we said, very you know comfortable with Zoom. And I'm going to ask him if he has any questions. So, Mike, do you have any questions for the panel? The panel. First of all, wonderful presentation, everyone. I'm sorry I'm not with you. Um, I will just have one observation about what's happening in the States, <clears throat> and that is this um, focus now on mitigation, not on containment. We've passed the stage of containment from where the, the feeling is that contact tracing, et cetera, has limited value now, and the big emphasis is the enormous changes Society, I'm sure you've seen in the news. What the emphasis on now is trying to see whether the U.S. can somehow flatten the curve. This is a new term which almost every American knows now. And what that means is spreading out the cases so that the health system can manage to take care of them. The Army Corps of Engineers may be called in to build hospitals around the states in preparation for what is here it happened, it's happening in Italy, and you heard today that Macron declared a war in France. But I just want to introduce you, and we have a lot to learn um, in terms of studying the value and the impact of the mitigation step strategy, which thank goodness you haven't had to use in, in Singapore. I had uh, two questions, um, which allude which to uh, your presentations. One is, I am struck by the rapid rise of the epidemic in a number of countries. And the now alleged, alleged um, reason for that is that it's a lot of asymptomatic uh, people that are doing this. Asymptomatic people are asymptomatic. They don't cough, they don't sneeze. And so there's a lot of uh, interesting questions being asked. Uh, do we have a precedent? Is there something special about this virus? Uh, why are we seeing it so easily transmitted uh, to, with, um, with um, if it's true, with so much of it early on, in particular by asymptomatic people? Uh, this is a question that many people are asking here in the state. The second question that I get asked over and over again is why um, Taiwan, uh, why Hong Kong, why Singapore has been able to have a successful containment strategy? Uh, and not only that, very, very few, I guess in Singapore, my understanding, no mortality or very low mortality in these three countries. What, I mean, I, I'm, I can't tell you how much the media has is asking, uh, what has been learned by these three countries? Is it just that they're small? Or are there other lessons that the world should have learned or still could learn uh, about the, um, what has been done both in prevention and treatment? So I'll stop there, Amina. I'm sure a lot of people have questions. <clears throat> do we, Lin Fan, do you want to try to answer some of those questions? Although I think um, some of them are pretty difficult questions. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> no one has an answer yeah, for the them. Ones that, oh, the ones that I am being asked by the media constantly. <laughs> yes. Fine. Yeah, I have a go yeah. first. Uh, is it working? So, Mike, the, the first question of whether this is uh, much more in 
infection has spread faster than any others, I, I don't agree because, you know, it is spreading faster than SARS, but compared with others, I think, you know, flu, for example, still, I think uh, uh, flu is much easier. The question of uh, asymptomatic uh, 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 spread. So in Singapore, in the famous example, use of serology, we retrospect to trace it back. The lady was sick, just very mild. And she had a low grade fever, recovered in a day, went to another party. All right. So they, this is like the German, you know, the first in you know, the commentary of asymptomatic uh, uh, transmission was withdraw the paper because the, uh, the interview to the patient was not thorough. Because the, the patient said, I did not say I was not sick. I said I was not severely sick. <laughs> so, you know, so to me, is this asymptomatic infection surely is happening, but is it happening uh, uh, more prominent than others? I don't think we have the solid evidence yet. So this is the, really the short answer to your first question. The second question is why Singapore, Taiwan, and you know, uh, 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 Hong Kong is doing much better. I think that Personally, I think the lesson from SARS, you know, that play a, a very important role. All these regions were heavily hit by SARS. And so the preparation from government to clinician to scientists are at a very different level, even from Australia. You know, I was working in Australia for SARS. We had a zero case of SARS patient. So the scientific community today, like, you know, is working together, but nowhere near what I'm experiencing in Singapore or in Hong Kong. So that my, that's my personal view. There is a, a, a lesson sort of learned from uh, 17 years ago. Thank you. Um, uh, hi, Mike. Uh, maybe I'll move into, are you able to see me? Yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah. I, I think, uh, so I'm going to speak about it from the healthcare side because, you know, I'm inundated with meetings uh, every day, uh, kind of like round the clock, essentially. And maybe from my perspective, there are probably three reasons why what we are seeing in Singapore is quite well controlled compared to what uh, we are seeing the chaos in uh, US, in UK and in other countries. First, I think the principle of containment remains the primary driver. And what we, when we do this, what we mean is that we do not even if there's a little community spread, we want to make sure that it is an extremely small community spread. So containment strategy requires a lot of resources, right? It requires you, every single case, you have an entire team of police officers tracing every single one that is have any contact in those period, what John was showing in the model, essentially. So containment strategy has been extremely high in Singapore. Uh, and this strategy was thought to be useless in other countries, and therefore they have gone to the second stage. So we are in, still in a containment strategy in Singapore. And what it means is that most of the cases are linked to some clusters or they're imported. If they're imported, then we make sure that it, there's no infection from the person that's, that's bringing it in. The second is exactly what we all know. We do an extraordinary amount of testing. So there are no mild cases that will see GPs twice for flu or cough or some kind of URTI and they say we won't test it. That is now not possible in UK. They've said you may or may not have it. We're not interested. It's actually just stay home. In US, probably it's been going on, mild pneumonias, mild URTIs. They just don't test it. So we test almost every single case. And the reason why Singapore can do it is because testing is now uh, widely available and there are multiple, in fact, more than sufficient primary care clinics that allows them to be able to do this, essentially. And the third, I think, is really the Singapore's, you can say, autocratic or central or a high, heavy government approach, right? Because information is extremely central. Is from MOH, MOH to the three cluster heads. The three cluster heads has task force with all three clusters in all institutions twice a week, essentially, right? So information is almost uh, uh, immediately passed down and therefore things are not haphazard. 
there's no misalignment of uh, what is a suspect case, what is not a suspect case, or if there is, it will be rectified within one or two days, essentially. Right? So there's complete alignment across the system. And therefore, in Singapore now, you have this really interesting situation that the uh, cases are soaked up by primary care clinics or the hospitals, and they are therefore not in a community, and which is why people walk around feeling safe. I, I hope that, yeah, and we are now dealing with the imported cases. So I think those are the three reasons why, uh, you know, we are a little bit different from US or uh, UK or Switzerland, which is another example that they said they kind of given up on the first containment strategy. So just to add, if you remove the containment from the model, you see a complete different scenario in Singapore. Containment is playing a very significant role. If that is lowered, everything will be completely different. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So uh, I promised the panel members that they have an opportunity to ask each other some questions before we open it up. So I don't know if anyone has a burning question, given that you're all coming at it from different perspectives. Okay. <laughs> Your models scared me a little bit because all your peaks are many, many months away. Yes. <laughs> so uh, if you if you look at the, the peaks, they are many months away because uh, if we assume that the current trend continues, then that is what is going to happen. But as I showed with different policies, the policies are going to uh, move the peaks down. And when the peaks goes down, the, the time that uh, we receive the end of the infection, also the peaks moves a little bit more. Uh, uh, report. So what we are saying is that if things continue, and in Singapore, what, what we are saying is that, as I said, the policies of containment, which is the priority, it's soaking up so much. If you move that in the model, you have a complete different scenario. And that, if that continues, and as we say, the important cases come in, if we're able to stop them and quarantine them so that they don't go to the communities, then we are going to have lower peaks and we're going to have everything at least slowing down within a very short as possible time. But the way things are going, if nothing happens, the peaks are going to be way in the future and we're going to see the infection going on for a long time. But when I looked at the gap between the model-based predictions and actual numbers, it seems that the actual numbers are a bit higher than the model-based predictions in the last few days. So so the actual numbers are high based on, uh, in, in Singapore, you're talking about Singapore. In Singapore, because of the new, uh, what do you call it, the number of people coming in from outside, because we didn't expect how many people are going to come from outside. And as I said, the issue is that if those people are captured and they don't go to the community to continue infecting people, then that's not going to be a problem. Because then we get them in the airport, we test them, and then we make sure that they are quarantined so that then they don't have that second day time to infect somebody else. But if they sneak through the system, then we're going to have, or we're going to have new clusters popping up all the time. Really appreciated all the talks, and they were very, Clearly, you said this multi, what was it, multi dimensional. dimensional. <laughs> the one interesting thing was is that there, and this is something I appreciate from what John presented, was, was um, you really can pull this all together. And one of the things that, that was apparent when it was pulled together, the modeling was something that could be done very, very early. Okay. In fact, some of it was being done early, and several weeks ago, the insight was, it was apparent that this issue of not knowing, number one, how many people in the community were asymptomatic and might be shedding virus, the fact that we still don't know the answer to that question is absolutely a pathetic, I mean, it's just the most pathetic statement I can imagine. Why is it we don't understand what is the, the prevalence in the community? Okay, now, what I was told at one point was that we can't do that here because we're using all of our resources for testing for sick people, well, they're sick. And it's not gonna change whether how we're gonna manage those people. They're already being, you know, they're being quarantined or they're being treated in the hospital. What we need to do is to use all those resources to figure out whether or not there are people out in the community who are shedding virus. That was something, if we had known that several weeks ago, we would have, had a, we would have certainly in the United States, but in, in Singapore, we would have been able to be more effective. I think that's, that's a really important issue. And the issue of, of not having a test that was, that was available, for example, the idea, as you mentioned, people are coming in from various other countries. They're all, I read in the newspaper today that, that, that people are coming into Singapore. Now that's, you're gonna see a, a completely new, new wave of, of virus in Singapore as a consequence. So people coming in because they know that if they don't come in before the deadline, they're going to, they're going to 
not be able to come in at all. Mm. Well, unless there is actually testing and, and sequestering, you're, everything you've done up until this point has been for naught. So, I mean, I think that the modeling exercise really has been a very valuable, a valuable exercise, and it can be linked to the economic analysis, and it can be linked to the data collection using electronic resources, because, because the question is, is not, not that we should be using everything we could possibly use and doing everything we could possibly be doing. We should be focusing our attention on what is going to delay that, delay that, that, that peak and what's going to um, allow us to retain the resources that we need for sick people who don't have COVID virus, retain those resources um, uh, for, uh, for those who need it. So, I mean, I think that's really where things are, uh, you know, where I think you could be pulling these things together. So my suggestion is you guys all start working with John. <laughs> <laughs> the message is very clear. <laughs> Can I uh, make a comment? Uh, I, I think David, those points are useful. And we are, uh, I would say maybe a month ago, nobody was really interested in anything outside of the hospital because you know the resources and the concentrate was really right in the hospital. But now is opportune time when the uh, situation in the hospitals is relatively stable. Uh, there's, of course, fatigue and there's still cases, but, you know, if you go to NCIE, read the report in Straits Times today, it's a very systematic process, right? People are sitting around, they get tested, it's just like almost like a, it's like a factory line, essentially. So they know what to do in the hospitals, right? And um, uh, I think the opportunity now to do some of these research in the community uh, in fact, NMRC is asking for grant call. This is the type that you do, serology in the community. Just do a thousand people. Uh, I, I can tell you there are probably two good things about this for research at the moment, right? People uh, have no problems giving you data, uh, at least at the hospital, right? Everyone will give you the contact thing. They sign whatever you tell them to do, essentially. So this is the only time that we are able to do it in the hospital. In fact, I'm kind of like, wish that we would have been able to collect these kind of consents, right? You know, uh, that the data will be collected, if necessary, you contact them, you know, that kind of stuff. So everybody does it at the hospitals now. So if you're going to do this kind of survey, I bet you the, the acceptance level of the community is there. And you probably can do population studies very quickly, 5,000 people, and people will want to do it. So in other words, questionnaire, serology, you know, uh, you never have another opportunity because people are just so afraid they want to contribute to this thing. The second very interesting thing that I, we have seen is that, uh, which I we were just talking a little bit about the travel restriction, which you are now saying is that uh, another major impact probably for uh, outside of the other impact that is not seen in the, for the economy, right? Not just the airline and the hotels, is that it's, it probably will kill medical tourism in many countries. You know, the private hospitals here that depends heavily on foreign patients, immediate tightening restriction. You know, if I speak to some of them, no one can come in now because if you have a, you're from overseas, you're not able to come in. Who's going to come in 14 days to stay before they see a doctor, right? That, that won't happen, essentially. So in other words, every country will have to see their own patients themselves, essentially. And so Singapore, which is supposed to be a medical tourism hub, at least for the private sector, that part is going to be severely damaged. So if you're looking at those stocks in Raffles or Parkway, they are going to be hit, I think, you know, on top of the you know, standard uh, uh, things. So, so those are changes in models of care that the, even the hospital systems have to deal with. Um, okay, I'm going to jump in here. And I have a question for Temur. Uh, and that's kind of look, uh, combining some of these things. So we, the, 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 all this discussion, which Mike alluded to about flattening the curve. And I think Singapore is a little bit different because their attempt is not just flattening the curve, but actually reduce it. But in a lot of the other countries, they're just looking to, you know, time it out so the health system is not so uh, under impact. And, you know, all that is positive. What impact does it have on the economy, the rate of recovery of the economy, when you continue to have to have social distancing and all those other strategies that flatten the curve? I mean, unmitigated negative. Uh, like I said, that if people are not going to the movies and not eating at restaurants and not traveling, 
you're basically taking away 10 to 15 percent of global GDP out of action. Uh, global tourism itself is more than 10 percent of GDP. So the only thing that is on the table now is can the governments go out and spend a lot of money to offset that massive damage. Uh, the silver lining is, along with global markets, interest rates have also fallen to basically zero. So the governments can basically borrow as much money as they want at zero cost uh, or zero interest payment. And therefore, uh, we probably will see 2008-2009 type fiscal response. So already in the US, for example, now that the markets have been completely underwhelmed by everything that the House and the Senate and the White House have announced, the next thing would be a big bazooka fiscal expanding measure, something in the range of 700 or $800 billion. Um, it still does not cure the virus. That's the problem. In 08-09, we had a very severe crisis of confidence because a lot of things that we didn't know existed and the contagion between asset managers in Euro versus uh, mortgage-based securities in the U.S., that, when it came to light, created a lot of panic. But it was a banking crisis, it was a financial crisis. You had very smart people sitting in central banks who knew how to handle it. And after an initial period of major turbulence, the right resources were devoted to the right problem. And within a year or two, we were on the clear course of recovery. Right now, the uncertainty is so palpable and that it's not clear, you know, money thrown at what? You cannot accelerate vaccine development. Uh, the optimal dosage for those who have COVID-19 is still not very clear after the various clinical trials, whether they'll be the one that can help care. So how long are we going to have no movies and no going to restaurants? Two months, three months, six yeah. months, right? Which is why, despite all the heroic measures that we've seen so far, the markets are going straight down. Okay, so just, just two, two observations or two questions. The, the first is, um, what do we need to learn about the origins, going back to Linfa's original presentation? How do we stop this happening again? I mean, we're going to get through this eventually at some point, or what we'd hope. So what is it that we've got to do upstream to try and protect this happening again? And the second point is, and as a Brit, I'm sort of quite alarmed and I've got loved ones back in the UK to see the way that they've gone from announcing a containment strategy on Monday and basically abandoning it on Thursday. Um, might, and you were talking about the, the difference in global policy towards this, might one of, and I, they're not exactly sharing their policy formulation, but might one opportunity be, rather than having this protracted low curve, and what the UK seems to be going for is a big hit and trying to get as many people infected and recovered as possible. I mean, the numbers are frightening. It's 32 million people infected, 7.9 million requiring hospital admission, and estimated deaths of somewhere in the region of 400,000 people in the UK alone. But if you get through that hit, in shorter order, you're back to whatever normal is going forward. Um, whereas if you have a more protracted, uh, low-grade but persistent that's going to keep your economic concerns going. So two questions, one upstream, what do we do to stop this happening again? Because this is sort of like one of those doomsday scenarios. And secondly, is there a, an alternative economic policy which just says take it as a hit uh, and, and get through it quickly, get to herd immunity, whatever that is, uh, so you can get beyond it. I mean, that's what, they, that's, that's what seems to be the UK government policy. Containment's been abandoned. <laughs> I will have a go first, and I pass to John actually, because to me that uh, the origin of the the virus. I mean, you know, we don't have a hundred percent evidence yet. Most likely, you know, in the past, right? We, you know, I have been telling people to say, in many of these forum, very high summit, you know, people ask us to see through the crystal balls to say, what's the number one threat of a pandemic? What's number two? And there's no debate. Number one is still influenza. So no matter what, you know. And number two, having been telling people of that long coronavirus because we know that thousands of the virus circulating. But as I say, it's not bats fault. They're having they're older than us humans. The bats and the virus are older than humans. So I think you know, uh, obviously a, a banning of wildlife trading and consumption is a very good start point. The reason I want to pass to John is this, you know, the international as regulatory. We have a WHO. The concept, I mean, the, the theoretical sort of value is very, very clear. They're supposed to coordinate these kind of 
So even for this outbreak, I'm thinking just, you know, uh, one is if you can prevent the trading and the consumption of wildlife, you may not have an outbreak, right? At least early warning and intervention at the international level, you know. So I'm going to pass to you, really, when you were talking about this, you know, I was thinking that, you know, we basically have, uh, have a law, but we don't have a police force internationally. So I don't know, you know, what's your view on this, how we can do more effectively for the next outbreak, whether it happens in China, Middle East, or even, you know, Singapore, for example, how can the international comes in to work with the national body and they have a much more effective policy? I think one of the critical weaknesses, and I alluded to that earlier, was that WHO has the kind of moral authority, but has no real authority, and neither does it have the resources to follow through, picking up in fast point. So even when it comes to coordinating things like expediting uh, new therapies, uh, sort of moving vaccines into the market, even that uh, emergency use and listing mechanism, when I read through it, is so sort of broad-based and motherhood, it doesn't really facilitate an actual follow-through and to really have effectiveness in this, it requires other NGOs and governments to come in. So in fact, that's why the Gates Foundation is so critical in terms of supporting something like CEPI, because if it was just WHO saying, yes, you should coordinate, you should facilitate faster vaccine approval, in fact, nothing very much will happen. Having said that, you need the WHO sort of uh, support. But I think what is really lacking now is, in fact, as Linfa was suggesting, a kind of real global policing mechanism or force. And I think this is where governments or regions need to come together. At the moment, a lot of this is happening, not really because of this anti-globalization theme that's going on. Everyone is every man for themselves at this point in time. And it's a lot of NGOs that are coming into play. And the hope seems to lie more in that direction. And the policeman has to be an international police force because, uh, you know, in to answer your question, we still don't know whether the virus is originally transmitted to human, but uh, Bats as a reservoir, I think, the last debate, but which animal was the intermediate, the equivalent of the civets for SARS and, the, you know, the pigs for nipper. And uh, in the media, and there will be paper coming out now, there's uh, lots of related virus in a very, very exotic animal called the pangolin. Pangolin is protected all over the world, but it's the most illegal traded animal as well. So if that is the intermediate hole, it may not originate in China because uh, there are two types of pangolin in our region. One is the Chinese pangolin, one is the Malayan pangolin. On the market in China, it's 100% Malayan because without China, they have a very restricted you know, policy to jail you if you trade that. If it's a foreign, it's less of a crime. <laughs> and, uh, and interesting, all the market is all the Malayan sort of uh, pangolins are being sold. Where are they from? Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, Laos. So if that is the carrier of the virus, the virus may origin from outside and trade you know, inside China. So the WHO and the international force is really the only solution to prevent future uh, events. Positive. Oh, sorry, just a quick point. This allowing herd immunity, um, after that was announced in the UK, I saw this Harvard epidemiolo epidemiologist writing in great horror about this. I mean, this is not a measles party, right, where you're trying to promote that. This is an unknown virus. Uh, its virulence, although it's being characterized more and more, is still an unknown entity. And to say you just allow your population to be infected uh, and segregate and focus your resources on the old and then let the young sort of just take it, even that is not an actually sound scientific approach because there are cases when, in fact, the young are very severely infected or affected, and you don't have enough resources to treat them, and not enough respirators and others, then they're going to, the mortality rate's going to go up. So I find that quite a horrifying prospect, yeah, actually. Quite horrifying. Yeah. So I think we've already gone over time, and we have one last question, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Hi, thank you so much for your time. We all really, all the students, we really appreciate it. Um, so I remember the H1N1 outbreak because I was in Melbourne at that time. And a bit of background, I'm from Holland now, so I worry a lot about my friends and family there. We should learn from history, right? So why is it that the H1N1 pandemic, for example, was so different than what is happening now? Could you like summarize it very quickly? So different, you're talking about the, the society's response or the disease itself? Society's response, what has happened now, the chaos. Okay, yeah, so in my first BBC interview, I used the term that uh, Donald Rumsfeld used when fighting terrorism. 
you're dealing with the known knowns, that's H1N1, because influenza, although I said in terms of pandemic, influenza is number one, but the general public knew this and had gone through this. And then you had the known unknowns and you had the unknown unknowns. So when SARS happened, it's the unknown unknown. We never knew the coronavirus can be so lethal. So COVID-19 is the known unknown. So I think we are still in that mode of uh, dealing with something that we did not know. And also that, you know, it, I mean, kind of the Chinese government put a lot of effort to say it's not SARS. I don't know if it's a good thing or bad thing because at least for SARS we knew, whereas COVID-19 now is, uh, for the general public, it becomes the unknown unknown. But for me as a scientist, it's actually no unknown. So I think that that played a lot in terms of uh, the different response to H1N1. Yeah, I mean, H1N1 still killed more people than we have now, although the deaths too may go, you know, up. But in terms of the total people infected at death toll, H1N1 was still greater than COVID-19 up to today. But to me, it's purely because it's unknown. Yeah. Actually, just one other point in terms of the therapies, because H1N1 was not so lethal uh, and similar to SARS once it petered out, there was no sort of uh, motivation for continued investment in terms of looking at treatments. And so, so a lot of things were left sort of hanging in the air. And that's very unfortunate uh, because if you just depend on big pharma to invest, they need a business case to do that, which is why, in fact, you need something like SEPI now, which is funded by the, mainly by the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust, where it's not really a profit making approach. Uh, and it's uncertain whether indeed the vaccine will just be needed for a short while or if it becomes endemic, then you keep on using it like an influenza vaccine. So I think the business case uh, also was a sad one because that was, uh, if, if we'd done more research back then, we'd be far more prepared now to deal with COVID-19. But I always say, you know, in ERD response, you know, even WHO or science, you can never get the perfect response. Either you over or you're under. And in today's society, with all the social media, government, scientists, WHO tend to go over. So one of the criticisms of H1N1 is actually oversupply of vaccine. So that's another difference. H1N1, we knew there's a vaccine. If I wait for three months, it will come. Which for COVID-19, everybody is saying you have to wait at least 12 months if you're lucky we have a licensed vaccine. But WHO was criticized of overstockpile H1N1. Personally, I disagree because, you know, if you don't do it and then more people become more severe and more people die, then WHO will be blamed. But I think they have an oversupply of a vaccine and the, the disease become actually turn out to be milder, then I think it's still a better scenario than the other way around. Well, all I can say is we are in a totally unprecedented situation worldwide and we are privileged to be in Singapore, which really seems to be handling it the best that it possibly can. There's still a lot of unknowns, but I really believe that. So with that note, I'll end and thank all the panelists. I think that was a great kind of multi-dimensional discussion, no answers, but uh, you know, we got to talk about it. And of course, uh, you know, special thanks to Temu to bring this very different dimension to this room. We never talk about these issues, but obviously they impact each one of us. So thank you all and let's give them a round of applause.